Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your holy word which you have given to us. The word is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that a man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. We pray that you will use your word this morning to accomplish that in us. My prayer is that you will help me this morning to articulate the message from your word in a way that your name will be exalted and that the heart of the hearers may be enlightened and encouraged. We pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. What are you seeking for in life? What are you seeking for in life? Put in another way, what outcome, what outcome, what result do you seek from life? Or what do you want to ultimately achieve in life? Is it money? Is it fame? Promotion? Status? Or status? As the Americans say. More things. But friends, the sobering reality is even after attaining these things, many people, if not all, are still not satisfied or fulfilled. Do you believe me? Is there something missing in your life? But you're not sure what it is or how to find it. Something that brings up this one big question. What would my life be like if I could only figure out what I'm looking for? What would my life be like if I could only figure out what I'm looking for? Friends, how do we find our purpose? How do we find our purpose? I think people are looking for something beyond the material realm. If you ask me, the purpose of life must be in somewhere in the spiritual realm, the purpose of life. As Christians, perhaps our purpose should be to be like Christ, according to Romans chapter 8, verse 29, where it says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Do you think our purpose should be to be conformed to the image of his son as a Christian? Well, I can tell you at least that is God's purpose for us, to be conformed to the image of his son. So do you agree that if we could be more like Christ, we would be more obedient to God, right? Christ was perfectly obedient to God. We would glorify God more in the things that we do every day if we could be uh, conformed more to the image of Christ. The Westminster Shorter Catechism says, in fact, that man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. In other words, the purpose of life for every man and woman is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Surely, we would have fulfilled our purpose in life if we could be more like Christ. Right? Amen? Okay. I just wanted you to think about the purpose of life. And today I'm going to help you to hopefully find that purpose. Ultimately. So from our previous message from the book of Colossians chapter 2, we have said that true spirituality 
lies in fellowship with God. True spirituality lies in fellowship with God. Fellowship through, with God through Jesus Christ. That is true spirituality. That's what we said last time. We have also seen that there are forces, or shenanigans as I call them, who want us to believe that we can have the edge on spirituality by following certain rules and regulations and ideas of this world. Rules and regulations and ideas initiated by mere men. Friends, people want to rob us of true spirituality and sell us a false spirituality. If you look at Colossians chapter 2 verse 8, you don't need to turn there, I'll just read it for you. It says there from our pre previous passage, previous message, Colossians 2 verse 8, it says there, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty the seed, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. Friends, these rules and regulations and ideas have one thing in common. They shape your and my mind for the things of this world. And there's nothing, nothing spiritual about that. That was about in our last message. And then we concluded true spirituality lies in the truth of God. The truths of God. And it comes, those truths come from above. It is not truths that are found in this world. It doesn't come from men or man. So today's passage is a command to seek those things that come from above. It's a command to us as Christians to seek those things that come from above. So let's turn to our passage for today, and that is in Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 4. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 4. If you don't have a Bible, there should be some extra Bibles at the back. Have they been all taken, Tiasani? But if you, there's somebody that wants a Bible, you can get one there. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 4. I'll wait for Narco or the person next to him. Anyway, Coloss Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 to 4. If then, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things that are above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Verse 4, when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. This is God's word to us this morning. So Paul commands the Colossians to seek and set their minds on the things above. To seek the things above and then to set their minds on those things. That is the command. In effect, he is saying it is time to shape and to transform your thinking from human ideas to godly ideas. Take it from below and turn it to above. Set your minds on the things of Christ. Paul also gives three reasons why the Colossians and we should seek and set our minds on the things above. The command is, if you're taking notes, the command is, seek and set your minds on the things above. And then we get three reasons from this passage why we should do that. The three reasons are, seek the things above because of what is true of your past. Seek the things above because what is true of your past. And that is in verse 1 to 3a. You have been raised and you died. That is the past. It is a past reality. 
The second reason, because of what is true of your present, that is in verse 3b, your life is hidden with Christ. And reason number three, because of what will be true of your future, in verse 4, you will appear with Him. Friends, because of these three realities or truths, past, present, and future, which, we'll, which we will be looking this morning at, because of those three truths, we should be seeking and setting our minds on the things above. We used to seek the things on earth and set our minds on worldly things. But these truths from above should now shape and transform our minds for heavenly things above. Thus, the title of our message this morning is Shaping Your Mind for Glory. Shaping Your Mind for Glory. So let's look at the first reason for seeking and setting our minds on things above. The first reason why we should be shaping our minds for glory. Because of what is true of your past, of our past, you have been raised, you died. Let's look at verse 1 to 3a and read that again. Verses 1 to 3a of Colossians chapter 3. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things that are above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died. You have been raised, and the, and the piece in, uh, passage into there, for you have died. This reality starts off, friends, with an assumption that the readers have been raised up with Christ and that they have died to the things of, a, of the earth. That's the assumption that the verse starts off with. So Paul is saying, if you were raised up with Christ, then seek the things that are above because that is where Christ is. We've sang this morning, we are hid in Christ, right? Paul is saying, seek the things that are above because that is where Christ is. So being raised with Christ simply means that you were raised from spiritual death to spiritual life. To be raised up with Christ means you were spiritually dead and now you have been raised up spiritually. You were given spiritual life. We say, theologians say, we were born from above. We received spiritual life. Let's go, you can turn back to the previous chapter, chapter 2, and look at verse 12 where it says, Chapter 2, verse 12 says it like this. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead, and you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, that is Christ, when he, when he raised him from the dead having forgiven us all our trespasses. Friends, when you are spiritually alive, you should be seeking the things above. Why seek the things above? Why, do we, why doing that? Because that is where Christ is, at the right hand of God. So when you are spiritually alive, you want to seek the true source of, of all life, which is Christ. Not only is he the source of life, but also the ruler over all life. That is why we should be seeking the things above where Christ is. Four years ago, when I <coughs> retired from work, colleagues there at work would ask me, what am I going to do now with my life? What am I going to do? People of my status or status 
meaning age and economical wise, would normally look for a place somewhere on the west or the east coast of South Africa or wherever in the world and settle there for retirement. That is what people normally do. Get as much out of life while you still can. Before you go, enjoy life to the full. Right? Who's got that in mind? Rob, why are you still sitting here? My answer to them was, and still is, that I'm hoping to spend more time to invest more time in the future. What do you mean by that, Johan? Meaning spending more time about in eternal things and the things above. That was truly my answer. I shared that at that time and many times with people. Because, friends, that will be the next stage of my life. That is the reality to me. That is going to be my next stage in life. And I'm not convinced that sitting at the beach, enjoying all those things, will be helpful to prepare myself for that. That is my honest opinion and my feeling, my, my, my view. Because that is where I'm going. All of us will get to, my, to that place where you will be going into eternity. The question is just, where will you go? But by God's grace, He is allowing me to do what I was hoping to do. That's why I'm standing here today. Of course, friends, this doesn't mean that you must wait for retirement to seek and set your minds on the things above. No, that is not what I'm saying. Don't wait. If you are a Christian, if you are a Christian, the new normal for you is to seek and set your mind on the things above. The normal used to be seeking and setting your minds on earthly things. Can you remember that? I remember very well what I used to set, seek and set my mind on. But the new normal for a Christian is to seek and set our minds on the things above. It means that you and I allow our minds to be shaped by the things of God. Friends, this is not rocket science. It is, but it isn't. It simply, in simple language, it means that whatever is important to God is now or becomes important to us if you are a Christian. Your life is governed by the word of God. But what is also true of your past is that you have died. You have died. You have died to the things that used to rule over your mind. You are dead to the worldly things which, you used, which used to dominate your, your, your mind. You are dead to those things. Friend, it means that those things don't rule you anymore. Let's, in the same chapter, chapter 2, let's read verses 20 to 23. If with Christ you died to the element, elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Why? Do not handle, do not taste, do not uh, uh, touch, referring to things that, are, that all perish as they are used, according to human precepts and teachings. Why do you still conform to what people say? How, why do you um, get, still getting influenced and overruled by human thinking. That doesn't mean we don't obey the laws and those things. That is not what I'm talking about. So the question is, are you guilty? Because Paul asked there, why, as if you were still alive in the world, you do those things? The question is, are you guilty of setting your mind on the things of man, the things of this world? It's a fair question. Please turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16.
and verse 21. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, verse 21. That's why we're looking there. The, lay, the outline of the message is the command to seek and set the things above and then three reasons why we should do that. We are in the, third, the first reason now. The Gospel of Matthew chapter 16 verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed. And on the third day, be raised. Verse 22. And Peter took him aside, he took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this will never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are setting your mind on the things, you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Friends, the question is, what is your mind set on? What do you seek? What do you set your mind on? Are you chasing a worldly agenda? Are you fitting your commitment to Christ somewhere into your worldly agenda. Whenever it suits you, you will come to church or you will do the things of God. Is, is that what you are doing? Is that your mindset? Whenever it suits you, you will do the things of your Lord and Savior. Or are you rather fitting your commit, commitment to the world into your Christian agenda. You know, you hear this often. Pastor, we would have loved to come to the church meeting of a prayer meeting. But you know, but this family or this work get together, it just came up, you know. Sound familiar? Are you guilty of that? What about telling the family of the work, you know what, we've got this important get-together at church. Sorry, I can't make this get-together with a family or with the work. Set your mind on the things that are above. And set your mind on the things that have value for eternal life, where Jesus is. Friends, this is not a, if you want to, this is a command. Jesus does not want you dead or alive. Rob, you will remember the early Western movies. When somebody did something wrong and the law was after him, they would say, get that guy dead or alive. Friends, Jesus doesn't want you dead or alive. He wants you dead and alive. Jesus wants you dead and alive. Dead to worldly thinking and alive to heavenly thinking. Being made alive in, for Christ and dying to self are part of a past reality. The second reason to shape our minds for glory is because of what is true of your present of your present and that is in verse 3b your life is hidden with Christ in God verse 3b that is the second reason because of what is true of your present now now the idea here of something hidden from being perceived is, is something the, the hidden with Christ, the word there uh, used uh, is crypto. And the idea there is something hidden from being perceived by the human mind. Now the word crypto gives you, it's the same as what you use for in, 
encrypted cell. Hidden is the word is used is crypto. Now, if you have a WhatsApp app on your uh, on your phone, when you send a message to somebody, the message actually gets encrypted. There came a encrypted uh, away there. <laughs> Uh, so your messages are getting in, in, encrypted. Why is that? Because you don't want anybody else to read your, your messages. So when somebody sends you a message, the message gets scrambled. That's what they call it. And your phone, when you receive a message, your phone decodes the encrypted, encrypt, encrypted message so that you can actually read it. Does it make sense? Now in the same way, your and my life is encrypted with Christ in God. So what does that mean? It, mean, it, it merely means that the unbelieving person cannot understand your faith in Christ. The fact that we are in Christ and what it means to be spiritually alive, friend, that means nothing to the unregenerate mind. They don't get it. They don't understand it. Turn with me to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 14 to 16. Just to help to, to understand what I'm talking about. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 14 to 16. Is there a natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. A spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? And it ends with but we have the mind of Christ. So friend, this is why the world does not know why we are no longer consumed by the things of this world. They can't understand that why we don't join in the partying and all the things that we used to do. They can't understand that. And they, can, and, and they also cannot understand why we are so consumed with this Jesus character. What happened to you? What went wrong? I'm encrypted. Or you are actually scrambled. You can turn if you want to to 1 John chapter 3 verse 1. It affirms this idea well. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. Right, just before Revelation. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. See, that, see what kind of love a Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it, the world, did not know him. The world does not know God. Friend. When people are born and grow up, they don't know God. Unless God revives your spirit, you will never understand what we understand. They will never understand what we understand because they don't know God. And we must not be surprised when people mock and slander us because their minds are close to the things of God. They don't, they just don't know God. Now through faith in Christ, the things above, the truths of God are decoded to us. When you are spiritually alive, these things, the things that I'm talking about this morning, you understand them. Faith in Christ is the key to unlock the things of God. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Hebrews 11 verse 6, if I'm not mistaken. Without faith, it is impossible 
to please God. That is why we must seek the things above, friends. That is why we must set our minds on the things above because God enabled us to understand it. Turn back to chapter 2 of Colossians again. We need to seek the things above and set our minds on them because, friends, Christ, Christ's desire for us is to know these things. Let's look at verse 2 to 3, starting at the second part of verse 2. It is Christ's desire for us to, to know him, and this is the way he wants us to know him, to reach all the riches and full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures and wisdom and knowledge. Friends, here we see again the hidden. Christ wants us to know all these treasures of wisdom and knowledge. But you're not going to find it anywhere. But in Christ. As simple as that. We are hidden with Christ, according to our passage today, we are hidden with Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures and wisdom and knowledge. That's what it means we are hidden in Christ, with Christ in God. That's where we find knowledge and treasures, and wisdom, and all the things that is mystery to the world, in Christ alone. The third and final reason to shape our minds for glory, the third and final reason, because of what is true, or will be true of your future. First one, true of our past, second one, true of our of the present, and now because of what is true of your future, you will appear with him. Verse 4 says, verse 4 says of chapter 3, when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So, you have been raised with Christ, in other words, you have been given spiritual life, and now seek the things above, and set your minds on the things above, because that is where Christ is. And we have, because we have a mind of Christ. You have died to the world, you don't seek the things of the earth, and you don't set your mind on the things on the earth, and we are hidden with Christ in God. All those treasures of knowledge and wisdom is available to us. That's why we understand them. Now, Christ, Christ is now your life. Friends, Christ means everything to you. Christ means everything to you and to me. Not a little bit here and a little bit there. He means everything to us. Christ is our life. Amen? Christ is our life. Let me share with you two quotes from H.A. Ironside. Elnest, you, had, you thought you were the only guy that would quote I inside this morning. But surely a, they, this is a sign that we, we were actually right to, to quote him. Let me quote two other uh, quotes from, from H.I. Ironside. He was a well-known preacher from the previous century. The first quote, No one ever lost out by excessive devotion to Christ. No one ever lost out by excessive devotion to Christ. The first one. The second one, Christ is a substitute for everything. For everything. But nothing is a substitute for Christ. I just thought that was fitting when we think about Christ is our life. Verse 4 says, When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Friends, let me tell you one thing. For now, the world around us, our family and friends who are not Christian, they don't recognize us as children of God because they themselves are not children of God. 
they also, they also don't recognize Christ as Lord. We know Christ is Lord. He's sitting at the right hand of God in heaven. They don't recognize Christ as Lord because they cannot do that. Now, I don't say this that we actually look down on them. Because what we know was and is always a gift from God. We must never think arrogantly of ourselves. It was given to us as a gift. Because we ourselves, even ourselves, cannot fully perceive these truths for now. The Bible is also clear about that. We do have understanding, some understanding, but not fully. But we trust God but we, and we know enough to know that we are children, His children, and that we, can, that we should obey Him. But boy, oh boy, a day is coming when the world will know exactly who we are. A day is coming when the world will know exactly who we are. A day is coming, friends, when we will fully understand and see who we are in Christ. I want you to go back to 1 John chapter 3. We've read the first verse, but I want us to read the, the following two verses, verse 2 and 3. 1 John chapter 3. A day is coming when we will fully understand and see who we are in Christ. Let me read that to you. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him, because we shall see Him as He is. And everyone thus hopes in him, purifies himself as he, Jesus, is pure. Friends, our passage for today is building up to a climax. For Christians, it is the climax of all climaxes. The beginning and the end of our passage functions as two brackets. The beginning of our passage in verse 1 and verse 4 functions as two brackets. The opening bracket, if you have been raised with Christ, that's the first climax. It's a climax. For Christians, it's always a climax when you are born again. The closing bracket in verse 4, when Christ who is your life appears, you will appear with him in glory. That is the ultimate climax. Friends, the question this morning is, are you in the bracket? Are you in the bracket being raised? And are you ready to appear with him in glory? Have you been raised past and will you appear with him future? Is your mind shaped with and for the things above? I'm asking you this morning. You and I need to think about the question. Is your mind shaped for glory? Is your mind shaped for glory? What a glorious thought. One day. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So my final question to you is, will you, will you appear with Christ in glory when he appears? Henry Ironside, whom I mentioned earlier, his father was called the Eternity Man. By the way, his father died when he was 27 years old. 
Henry Ironside was three years old when his father died, but his father was known, was called the eternity man. Because every time he met someone, he asked them, where will you spend eternity? Friends, where will you spend eternity? Have you been raised with Christ? Have you been raised with Christ? If you have been raised with Christ, you will spend eternity with Him and you will appear with Him in glory. If not, if not, you will spend eternity in turmoil without Christ. Without Christ. Before I close in prayer, I, I, I invite you to speak to someone from this church if you are not sure where you will spend eternity. Friends, speak to some, someone. Speak to somebody from our church if you are not sure where you will spend eternity. It's important. There's nothing more important in this life and in the life to come. Today, today is the day of salvation. Let me pray for us. Lord, thank you for sharing with us all these truths and treasures and wisdom and knowledge hidden in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is our life. Thank you that you have given us your spirit to discern these wonderful truths and that by them our minds can be shaped for the glory that awaits us when Christ will return soon. We pray that we will take a hold of every opportunity, using it to shape our minds for the things above. Amen. Thank you, friends.